been well into 2 p.m. I'm Jasmine and I'm um, a staff member for the State Library and Archives Service and I'm very proud to be introducing um, our colleague Kate Vermey today and so she can share her knowledge with you about um, the new Norfolk Asylum. Uh, she has a degree in history and early childhood education so she has enjoyed mining our archives uh, during her time here and we're very lucky to be able to have her give us this talk. Um, before she begins, I will do a welcome to country. Libraries Tasmania recognises the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lutruwita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging who hold the memories, traditions and culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. And I welcome everyone who is joining us um, through the webinars today. And I hope that you enjoy the talk and we will have an opportunity for a Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Okay, so just a, a couple of little notes before I start. Um, you will hear me reference the hospital and the asylum. They are actually one and the same place. In 1859, the New Norfolk Insane Asylum was renamed the New Norfolk Hospital for the Insane. So don't get confused, I am talking about the same place. There it is. In 1879, Dr. George Francis Houston, Surgeon Superintendent of the Renal Asylum from 1855 to 1880, was charged with a criminal assault against his then matron, Mrs. Gertrude Kenny. Unfortunately, I do not have any images of Mrs. Kenny. Um, she seems to have been lost to history, I think. The two charges levelled against him were summed up by a report and evidence of the Hospital Commissioners Committee in 1879, which stated that one, Dr. Houston, in July 1878, and between that time and the end of December, took indecent liberties with Mrs. Kenny, and two, that on the 21st of December, at half past 10 a.m., on the occasion of a professional visit made to Mrs. Kenny in her bedroom, Dr. Houston unbuttoned his trousers, got into bed with her, and had sexual intercourse with her. The media of the day dubbed the scandal the Kenny Affair, and it made for sensational reading for the people of Victoria and Tasmania. So who was G.F. Houston and how had he come to this? George Francis Houston was born in Hertfordshire. Some people say Ireland, but that's actually incorrect. It was his father that was born in Ireland. So he was born in Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire in England in 1813 and was the first son of George Francis Houston Sr. He was a surgeon and his wife's name was Mary Ulnett and he had two older sisters and a younger brother, Joseph William Alnett Houston, who also settled in Tasmania in the Norfolk area. And after his mother's death, his father did remarry, and so he had an additional three children, three daughters and three sons. According to the unpublished manuscript, the Clark family history, including the Houston and Arnett forebears, which includes a chapter on the Houston family written by Peggy Hull, a descendant of the Houstons through the Gaynor line, are you confused yet? George Francis Houston was well educated, but not in any particular profession. And he arrived in the colony of Van Diemen's Land in the early 1830s. By 1834, he was living in Hamilton and had applied for the position of the government schoolmaster, which he was granted. In 1835, Dr. Houston married Sarah Hawthorne, and Sarah was 18 at the time, and her mother had to grant permission to take place because for the marriage to take place because she was technically underage. Um, on his marriage certificate, it actually lists his profession as a surgeon, although he was actually working as a teacher at the time. Um, just as a little side note, in 1833, prior to her marriage to George Francis Houston, Sarah actually sued her previous fiancé, Mr Michael Steele, for breach of promise and was awarded £200 in compensation. Uh, they actually did publish that in the papers of the time, as they did, including private letters that were sent to um, Miss Hawthorne from Mr Steele. You can imagine how well that went down. Between 1836 and 1859, George Francis and Sarah had nine daughters, Amelia Jane, Sarah Francis, Mary Louise, Francis, 
Annie, Harriet, Kate, Florence, and Ethel, and two sons, George Francis, I know they all might name themselves after themselves, and Henry Joseph. Dr. and Mrs. Houston would later be granted also the guardianship of their three grandchildren after the death of their eldest daughter, Amelia Gaynor, in 1860. Four of their daughters would go on to marry very prominent members of the Tasmanian Society. Kate married the Solicitor General Robert Patton Adams in 1870. Mary Louisa in 1867 married James Mallard Clark, who would become the Chief Clerk of the Lands Department. Sarah in 1860 married Walter Angus Bethune Jamison, remember that name, and he was the warden of New Norfolk Municipality. And then we have Annie. Now, Annie married Curzon Northport in 1864, and which if you've heard my other talks, you will know how well that went. In 1838, George Francis Houston filed for insolvency and then took up a position as an assistant to a surgeon. By May 1839, he was advertising his services as a surgeon and a male midwife in New Norfolk. In 1840, he was appointed by the governor as the inspector of stock at Spring Bay. And in 1841, under the new convict probation system, Browns River Probation Station was established and he was appointed as the medical officer. Uh, a side note too, when they were living in Browns River, Sarah Houston's sister, Frances, Again, um, was also living there at the same time, and she died of pulmonary disease at the age of 32 in August of 1843, and Dr Houston was the man who registered her death. They also, so George and Sarah also lost their daughter, who was named after her aunt, Frances. She died in November of the same year of water on the brain, so she was 14 months old. I imagine that was a very sad time for that family. Interestingly, although he was employed as a medical officer and practised as a surgeon, George Francis never received any formal education in medicine. It is believed that he most likely apprenticed to his father in England before coming to Van Diemen's Land. One would hope he did some sort of training. In fact, the Lieutenant Governor of the day questioned Houston's medical qualifications, but Dr J. F. Clark, the principal medical officer at Browns River, Browns River Station, stated for them to be satisfactory for the position for which he had been appointed. And in 1843, he was judged by the Board of Medical Examiners sufficiently qualified to practice as a surgeon, and he then called himself Dr. Houston. By 1847, he was working for the Imperial Convict Department as a medical officer at the coal mines in the Tasman Peninsula, where the family would suffer the loss of another child, their 17-month-old daughter, Harriet. She died of dysentery. She was 17 months old. In May 1848, the family returned to New Norfolk and George Francis was appointed the assistant surgeon and second in charge at the New Norfolk Insane Asylum and was also appointed as a magistrate for the area. His career and influence in New Norfolk was certainly on the rise. However, in 1852, he was sent to Norfolk Island as an assistant surgeon. Unfortunately, due to bad health in 1855, he left his post and was again and was appointed the surgeon at the Hobart General Hospital for a short time. Upon returning from Norfolk Island in 1855, George Francis Houston left the service of the Imperial Government, and it was around this time that the Norfolk Insane Asylum was handed to the colony and the first commissioners of the hospital were appointed. That's important. On the 24th of October that same year, the first meeting of the commissioners was held and George Francis Houston Esquire was made chief surgeon in charge of the hospital. In December, he was given the title of superintendent and medical officer of the, of the lunatic asylum at New Norfolk. And the family moved into Frescati. Now, this is, oops, that one, there we go. So that's Frescati. I'm afraid the picture's not great. I couldn't actually find an original. I had to get that from um, the girl that book a trouble asylum. So that was Frescati in its heyday. And that was Frescati in February 2020 when I took that photo. It's been derelict. In 1860, tragedy struck the family when his eldest daughter, Amelia Jane Gaynor, who had only recently returned to Tasmania from her home in Ireland, died of consumption. Her three children, aged three, two and 14 months, came to live with Dr and Mrs Houston at their home for Scarty and later at Les Maison in Humphrey Street, New Norfolk. Now, again, same thing with that picture. That house was actually um, destroyed. It was put down as a, as a fire hazard some years ago. But that is where he lived with his family after 
he retired from the hospital. It happens to be a stone's throw from the hospital, so he was never far away. Letters between members of the Gaynor family and the Houston wards, published in Peggy Hull in her family history, The Ark That Binds, being an ancestry of the children of Henry V.S. Seymour Gaynor and Florence Lillian Gaynor, back four generations, show a genuine warmth between the families and great respect and affection for Dr. Houston. Pray give my respectful inquiries and good wishes to your good grandfather, whom I've always spoken of is so kind and so good. Domestic life seems to have been relatively happy for the Houstons at Frascati. They immerse themselves in the society, both of the local community as well as in Hobart Town. Most frequently, however, they could be found with their father at the asylum, where they were known to take their pianoforte into the female patient's dining room to amuse them. James Mellard Clark, so he married um, one of George Houston's daughters, wrote in his journal on the 24th of May, 1861, that he arrived in New Norfolk at about 6.30, went to the asylum, danced and amused myself with the Houstons until 2 a.m. and slept at Frascati. It would be just one of many times James would write about his time with the Houstons in New Norfolk. If my thing's broken. Oh, there we go. Ooh. Okay, so this is a map. This is actually from our collection, this map. So this is a very basic map to show you. So the red arrow is where Frascati is. The green arrow shows the precinct of the hospital. And the blue arrow shows the approximate location of um, Lamy's arm. So you can see he never actually moved very far from the hospital. He was always around. It is generally accepted that Dr. Houston's management of the asylum was a positive one. In November 1863, the Launceston Examiner ran an article which was full of praise for Dr. Houston and the hospital, said. It is, I believe, very generally acknowledged that the New Norfolk Asylum stands preeminent throughout the colonies for the admirable mode of its management, the great skill, success and celebrity of the institution it is doubled owing to the skill, care and humanity of the superintendent and medical officer. The superintendent seems to govern by a nod or a frown and to encourage by a smile. His sympathy with his patients and their attachment to him is very evident. Alexander Lang, a former employee of Dr Houston at the asylum, wrote in his autobiography that Dr Houston was benevolent, affable, courteous and gifted with great forbearance and patience, who did not permit any of his subordinate officers to use the slightest violence or threat towards his patients. But now let's jump a bit to the Norfolk Asylum in March 1878. The recently appointed matron, Mrs Kenny, was going about her duties at the asylum when she was violently attacked by a patient. She suffered a kick to the abdomen, which caused injuries so severe she was unable to work for almost a year. It was during her convalescence that the alleged attack by Dr. Houston occurred. At that time, Mrs. Kenny did not report the alleged assault, but were later confined to Mrs. Sarah Houston, so Dr. Houston's wife, and Lady Officer. So Lady Officer uh, was Jemima Officer, and she was the wife of Sir Robert Officer, who was a member of the Legislative Council. He was a surgeon, and at that time, he was the president of the hospital. In fact, it would be Mrs. Sarah Houston who would ultimately bring these allegations into the light when in May of 1879, she brought the matter to her son-in-law, Mr. Walter Angus Bethune Jamison, a commissioner of the hospital and warden of the municipality of New Norfolk. There is conjecture as to why Mrs. Houston chose to do this months after being told of the alleged incident, knowing that Mr. Jamison would have no choice but to bring the matters to the other commissioners and therefore potentially subject her husband to public exposure. Some say it was because Mrs. Kenny was showing signs of pregnancy and rumours of her impending delivery and who the father of her child was were rife amongst the hospital staff, but more on that later. After meeting with his mother-in-law on the 7th of May, 1879, Mr. Jamison called a meeting of the following day, so the 8th of May, 1879, between Mrs. Kenny, Dr. Houston, Mrs. Houston and himself where he would ask Mrs. Houston in the presence of Mrs. Kenny and Dr. Houston to confirm those statements which Mrs. Houston alleged Mrs. Kenny to have made to her. Mr. Jamison questioned Mrs. Houston as follows. Was it true that Mrs. Kenny told you that, told you that Dr. Houston had had improper intercourse with her? She answered, yes. 
Was it true that Mrs. Kenny had told you that she was in the family way by Dr. Houston? The answer, yes. Was it true that Mrs. Kenny told her that Dr. Houston had promised to maintain and support her? The answer, it was. Was it true that Mrs. Kenny had told her that Dr. Houston had promised her, Mrs. Kenny, that there should be no result? Answer, it was. In fact, he was to destroy the child. Mrs. Houston also said that Mrs. Kenny had told her that Dr. Houston had behaved in a disgusting and improper manner at her bedside and that he was giving her stuff to procure a miscarriage or abortion. Mr. Jamison believed that it was Mrs. Kenny's wish to, for the matter to be forgotten and he asked Mrs. Kenny if she wanted the matter hushed up. She replied in the affirmative. I, Mr. Jamison, informed her that my duty was clear and that I had but one duty to perform and that was to bring it before the commissioners, which I should do. Once the commissioners of the hospital were made aware of the charges and they appointed a committee to make, they appointed a committee to make a private inquiry and report of the affair. A meeting of the Committee of Commissioners was held in Hobart Town on May 28th, May 29th and June 16th of 1879, during which statements were taken from Mrs Kenny, Dr Houston and others. These statements would be compiled into a parliamentary report, Kenny v Houston, Report of Evidence by the Committee to the Commissioners. That's actually available here in our collection. As part of the Commission, evidence was presented by both the prosecutrix, Mrs Kenny, and the defence, Dr Houston. I have summarised Mrs Kenny's statement of evidence, which was taken by the commissioners on the 28th of May, 1879, and it is as follows. The first instance took, instance took place about July, 1878. Mrs Kenny had been recuperating from injuries sustained in discharging her duties, namely she was kicked in the stomach by a patient. One evening, Dr Houston arrived at the matron's cottage, which was not at all unusual as he had been attending to her since her injury. Mrs Kenny was in the parlour. Dr Houston called to Mrs Kenny and she went to him, expecting to be examined. He kept standing by me some time. He took my hand and in not very gentlemanly like manner, he pressed it against his person. I felt very much annoyed at the time and he pressed my hand outside his trousers. Very shortly afterwards, he left. The next day, Mrs Kenny recalls Dr Houston making allusion to the fact that he had not slept and he made the comment, haven't you an evil conscience? The second event occurred at about 10.30 on a Saturday morning in September when Dr Houston called on the matron. Mrs Kenny claims that Dr Houston ordered me to bed for medical reasons and then describes what happened next. When Dr Houston came into my room, he made some remark to the effect that he was glad I was getting well. After standing by the bedside for a minute or two, he got into my bed or laid down on my bed and behaved in a rude manner. He did not undress himself. I did not see what he was going to do. He did not take his boots off. He raised the bedclothes and got into my bed. He certainly pulled some of them over himself. I had no idea what his intentions were. I did not see him com commence to undress himself. He did not do so. He must have unfastened his trousers. They were unbuttoned, most certainly. I know for a fact for I saw them afterwards unbuttoned in part in front of him. Dr. Houston had connection with me. He put his private part in mind just for a minute. I did not speak then. I was very much distressed. And after he had sat down on the side of my bed, I did not move away. I did not make any attempt to leave my bed. I was so astonished by his behavior. I said afterwards to him that I had great respect for him. And he said, what now? And I said, it was very wrong of you. And he said, but I could not help it. Also, he said he had grown very fond of me during my illness, and I said, it was very naughty. And he said, it was very wrong of you to tempt me. It was very wrong, and it shall never occur again. And she was an old temptress, old Gertrude. Mm -hmm. hmm. He seemed very sorry about the, affair and about the affair, and he asked me repeatedly to be friends and to kiss him. I did not do so, but he kissed me, and he left the room. Although Mrs. Kenny claims that she did not intend to tell anyone about what had happened the previous December, it had she had hoped to find new employment and leave the asylum quietly. It was not long afterwards that she spoke to Mrs. Sarah Houston, which would be her downfall. Mrs. Kenny recounts her conversation with Mrs. Houston as follows. It was after the ball, the Sunday after New Year's Day, I spoke to Mrs. Houston. She said to me, what is the matter? As I seemed so much depressed. She said, has the doctor been rude to you? I said, how can you ask me such a question? Her reply was, because I know the man. She then, before I replied to the question, said, he's a very sensual man. He has had three children by a patient. Mm 
Mrs Kenny questioned Mrs Houston about the claim with Mrs Houston declining to answer further, saying she would tell me more at another time. Mrs Kenny confessed to Dr Houston, confessed that Dr Houston had been rude to her, but did not give her any particulars at that time. Mrs Kenny states that Dr Houston would not tell anyone as she was afraid to do so. Mrs Kenny thought this remark unbecoming a wife and asked Mrs Houston not to visit again. About a fortnight later, however, Mrs Kenny did confide again to Mrs Houston the full particulars of what occurred between me and Dr Houston. Some weeks later, Mrs Kenny was suffering from a swollen abdomen and Mrs Houston believed that she was in the family way. Further conversations are alleged to have happened between Mrs Kenny and Mrs Houston during the following weeks. Mrs Sarah Houston being concerned about the behaviour of the doctor towards Mrs Kenny and that the nurses were talking about Mrs Kenny's appearance. Mrs. Kenny told Dr. Houston that she, told Mrs. Houston that she would tell Dr. Houston that, that she had confided in her. To which Mrs. Houston replied, "Do not. He will poison us. I will put nothing past him." Sounding familiar? Mrs. Kenny stated in her evidence that at the time of the assault, she did not complain to anyone save Mrs. Houston and Lady Officer. Some weeks later, I did not speak to Dr. McFarlane. So Dr. McFarlane was second in charge of the asylum at that time or go to the nurses or any commissioner. It would appear that Mrs Kenny was attempting to go about her life with as little, little disruption as possible until she could find other employment. And that was until that May of 1879, when she was called over to the office on one occasion when Mr Jamison was there, along with Dr and Mrs Houston. I had no idea what they wanted. I, told them that Dr. I was told that Dr Houston wanted to see me. On going to the office, I saw Mr Jamison, Dr. Houston and Mrs. Houston. Mrs. Houston was making some statements and I said that my pregnancy was only in her own imagination. Dr. Houston said, in justice to Mrs. Kenny, I must say I was tempted once, but there was no carnal connection. Mrs. Houston said, why did you come here tempting my husband? What have you done with the bastard child? Her words, not mine. She attacked my character and threatened to strike me. I denied their truth as regards to my pregnancy and I told Mr Jamison that I wished nothing further to be done in the matter. I meant in the court of justice. Following Mrs Kenny's statement of evidence of what had occurred during that meeting on May the 8th, Dr Houston read a statement from his son-in-law, Walter A.B. Jamison, and the statement opens with a question put to him by Dr Houston. He asked Mr Jamison if the reason this inquiry was brought about was because Mrs Houston had told Mr Jamison about a scandal reported between Mrs Kenny and myself. Mr Jamison agreed, saying that the conversation between himself and Mrs Houston took place on the 7th of May, 1879. After hearing her accusations, Mr Jamison went to speak to Dr Houston, who denied the charges as an infernal and gross lie. On the following day, May the 8th, he set up a meeting between himself and Dr and Mrs Houston. Mrs Kenny was not present during this meeting. It was only after speaking with the Houstons that Mr Jamison sent for Mrs Kenny and, as previously mentioned, the parties met in Dr Houston's office, where Mr Jamison put questions to Mrs Houston regarding the validity of what Mrs Kenny had told her. Mr Jamison states that during the questioning of Mrs Houston, Mrs Kenny occasionally interrupted and interjected remarks and expressed her views as to Dr Houston's kindness, attention and consideration during her illness that she had never received anything but the greatest kindness from him and had always spoken so of him, that she had but no one, but, oh, sorry, but she had but on one occasion been guilty of an act of rudeness. According to Mrs. Jamison's statement, Dr. Houston then replied, you have tempted me, but I resisted you, but denied that any intercourse had taken place between himself and Mrs. Kenny. Mrs. Kenny did not answer when asked if she was pregnant and she stated that she never told Mrs. Houston that she was pregnant, that is, and that Mrs. Mrs. Houston had spoke, spoken falsely. In private conversation later between Mr. Jamison and Mrs. Kenny as he walked her back to the matron's cottage at the conclusion of that meeting, Mrs. Kenny did in fact confide that she was not pregnant. It was confirmed in a statement from Dr. McFarland that Mrs. Kenny was suffering from an abdominal tumour in connection with the bladder, which had formed an abscess and caused her abdominal swelling and great pain. She had never been pregnant in the time that he knew her.
The next statement to be read was that of Mrs. Sarah Houston. It was read by Dr. Houston, but not received as evidence. In it, she confirms that she was present on the 8th of May, 1879, in the office of her husband, Dr. Houston, Mrs. Jam Mr. Jamison, and Mrs. Kenny, and that the statements she had given to Mr. Jamison on that day were true and correct, and that Mrs. Kenny had told her that Dr. Houston had behaved in a rude manner at her bedside, and that she was pregnant, and that she thought she was so because of her increased size. Statements are also taken from three nurses who worked at the asylum, Kate Croswell, Elizabeth Dobell, Emily and Emily Ransford, as well as by the gate attendant, Mrs. Margaret Yoland. These statements were given in what appears to be support of Dr. Houston. They stated that it is the opinion of the institution that Mrs. Kenny is untruthful. Well, I'm not suggesting that these statements were incorrect as relates to the scandal between Dr. Houston and Mrs. Kennedy. We must bear in mind that these women were at the mercy of Dr. Houston for their livelihoods. Kate Croswell had been a nurse at the asylum for 13 years, Elizabeth Dobell for six months, Emily Ransford for close to seven years, and Mrs. Margaret Yoland, an attendant for 11 years. Lady officer, in a written statement, stated that Mrs. Kenny told her of conduct of unseemly character by Dr. Houston towards her, and that Dr. Houston threatened her should she have called out during the alleged attack. Lady officer advised that this lack of calling out made her look as if she was a willing party. A letter written by the Premier, Dr. William L. Crowther, yes, he appears in this one too, On the 29th of May, 1879, to Mr. Tarleton, who was a commissioner on the committee, and it was presented in support of Mrs. Kenny, and it read, My dear sir, Mrs. Kenny called at my house yesterday and placed me in possession of all the facts and circumstances in connection to the criminal assault made upon her by the medical superintendent of the lunatic asylum. She tells me there appears to have been an attempt to throw doubt upon her moral character. Mrs. Kenny lived under my roof for 10 years as a nursery governess. She married from our house and within a few weeks afterwards returned, remaining until circumstances rendered it necessary for her to leave. A more trustworthy, virtuous and religious woman I have never met with and trust after this declaration on my part that you will lend your aid should she be right in her surmises and at once put a stop to any action in this direction. I have the honour to be your very dear sir. Yours truly, William L. Crowther. Dr. Houston also gave evidence in the form of a statement written on the 5th of June, 1879, and in it he denied anything improper taking place between he and Mrs. Kenny, and he discussed the injury that had occurred to Mrs. Kenny when she was kicked by his patient, and that was back in March, 1878, and that he had been treating her for this injury. This treatment included conducting internal examinations, which I always conducted in as delicate and professional manner as possible. And Dr. Houston referred to the tumor, to the tumor that he felt during these examinations. Sometimes it necessitated the use of a catheter and that she would never let a nurse assist her, but ordered them to turn her back on her. Over the course of his treatment, Dr. Houston states that in October, 1878, I had examined her fully, both abdominally and per vagina, and thought that she was going to be all right. She appeared quite anxious about her state. She took my hand in hers and begged me to tell her if she would ever be well again. She then threw her other hand over my shoulder and to some extent pulled me towards her. I yielded for an instant to that I considered an embrace and clasped her around the waist. I immediately saw the errors of my ways and I said, this is wrong, I am sorry but you should not tempt me. In at least two minutes, in at less than two minutes, I left, I left the room. He claims they remained on friendly terms and that Mrs. Kenny had never shunned or avoided him or given any indication of what she had been saying to others, including his wife, until that meeting with Mr. Jamison on the 8th of May, 1879. He then handed her care over to Dr. McFarlane. He concludes his statement by saying, it is with some satisfaction that I can refer to my now 39 years of service as a government medical officer, of which 23 years and nine months have been in this institution, during which period no charge of any kind affecting my personal, moral or professional reputational character has been made against me. And I believe that I enjoy the friendship and esteem of not only my professional brethren, but of a large circle of friends, which I hope to still retain in spite of the malevolence, malevolent, 
of my arch enemy and her unscrupulous friends. The committee concluded their sitting on 16th of June 1879 and compiled a report of evidence which was, permission, which was presented to the commissioners. Within this report is a letter written by Mrs Kenny's recently engaged counsel, Mr Charles Hamilton Bromby. He was actually the brother of um, Dean Bromby, who was the Anglican Dean of Hobart. Um, the Honourable Colonial Secretary Thomas Ryby dated 10th of June 1879, and he writes in part that in relation to the depositions taken by the commissioners of the Abdu Norfolk Asylum, that Mrs Kenny was not represented by any legal advisor. Mrs Kenny did not know whether the commissioners had any right to examine the witnesses, that she believed she could refuse to answer any questions put to her by Mr Houston or the commissioners, that she was suffering from ill health due to the injury she had inflicted upon her in the course of discharging her duties at the asylum, that she was confused and that by being examined by Dr Houston, she was unable to state the facts of Dr Houston's conduct towards her so clearly or fully as she would have been otherwise able to do, and that she did not know the witnesses were going to be called and was quite unable to examine those witnesses herself. She calls the testimony of the nurses untrue. She feels that her character has been attacked without opportunity having been given, been given to her to vindicate it. One can only imagine how Mrs Kenny must have felt being thrust into that situation, a situation that questioned her character, stripped her of her dignity and shoved her into the public spotlight, a place where she was portrayed as a villain, a temptress, whose lies threatened to destroy the esteemed elderly doctor. He was 65. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I can only imagine how extraordinarily difficult and excruciatingly embarrassing and humiliating it must have been for her to relive what happened in front of not only her alleged attacker, but also a room full of men. Things haven't changed much. Having been unrepresented during the committee's inquiry, Mrs Kenny went, was at a distinct disadvantage, not knowing how to proceed or even question the evidence of witnesses before her. She had to have been like a deer in the headlights, completely out of her depth. On the 30th of June, 1879, Henry Butler, who was the committee president, concluded that, having thus fulfilled to the very best of our ability and the very onerous and painful duty entrusted to us, it only remains for us to record our conviction upon a claim and impartial review of the whole of the surrounding circumstances connected to the statements of Mrs Kennedy, Mrs Kenny, sorry, they are such as to carry a strong presumption that her testimony is false and that the charges she preferred against Dr Houston are false and without foundation. The reasoning the Commission gave as to why the case against Dr Houston was dismissed are as follows. The occurrences took place between July 1878 and December 1878 and Mrs Kenny had concealed the treatment she had received from everyone for a period of three weeks, although she had the fullest opportunity of making immediate complaint to all the officers of the hospital or inhabitants of the town. The occurrences took place in the matron's cottage, and the matron's cottage uses the two front rooms, and the matron uses the two front rooms as her parlour and bedroom. These rooms are overlooked by windows of the women's ward and were near to inhabitants of the passage of passengers who could have either heard or interrupted at any time, and Dr. Houston would have known that the implication being that Dr Houston would not have chanced assaulting her while well, he could be so easily caught. Then, that when confronted by Dr Houston, Mrs Houston and Mr Jameson on the 8th of May, Mrs Kenny denied that she had ever told Mrs Houston that Dr Houston had had connection with her and that it was only one act of rudeness had occurred which the doctor had admitted to. Dr McFarlane testified due to her tumour I doubt it would have been possible for Mrs Kenny to bear any connection with any man. I am sure she could not bear the slightest pressure on her abdomen. Whenever I pressed her abdomen, however slightly, she shrank. The slightest pressure gave her pain. A man having connection with a woman and being in the usual position could not avoid pressing upon her tumour and such pressures would give acute pain. That up to May the 8th, Mrs Kenny continued to be on friendly terms with Dr Houston and allowed him to continue to treat her, often thanking him for, her, for his kindness towards her. The committee questioned whether this was a constant or probable conduct of, on the part of a woman who had been so grievously outraged as Mrs Kenny now alleged. <laughs> 
Mrs Kenny could not remember the date in December of the sexual inter well, when the sexual intercourse took place between herself and Dr Houston, only later stating it was on Saturday the 21st and that Dr Houston had visited her the night before and advised that she remain in bed. Dr Houston was able to provide proof that he was not at the hospital on the 20th and therefore could not have visited Mrs Kenny as she had stated. Ultimately, despite the, character, despite the character reference applied by none other than the Honourable W.L. Crowther, it came down to who the committee believed to be more truthful. It was decided that the evidence in the course of this inquiry has been brought before us that during her period of service at the asylum, she, Mrs. Kenny, was not truthful. Dr. Houston, on the other hand, is now drawing close to a long and honourable career in the public service and has ever been esteemed in the relations of private life as an upright and truthful man. On 1st of July 1879, Mrs Kenny received notice that the Commission had suspended her from her position as matron. On the 7th of July 1879, Mrs Kenny writes to His Excellency the Governor in Council in which she meticulously outlines her allegations against Dr Houston and includes numerous professional and personal references as to her character. Um, these testimonials were written by people such as Mrs Crowther, Mary Ann Bromby, who was the president of the Girls' Industrial School, and Lady Jemima Officer, as well as other members of the Industrial School Committee. And they were actually used as her references for when she applied for the job of matron in 1877. Within this letter to the governor, she references the inquiry held by the Committee of Commissioners, and she states, I have the honour to represent the following facts to Your Excellency. Those facts being that she was appointed the head matron of your Norfolk Hospital in, for the Insane in January 1878. And prior to that appointment, she was the matron of the Girls' Industrial School and she enclosed testimonies as to her character. And on the 21st of December 1878, while severe, suffering severely under the illness, Dr Houston visited me to perform the usual operation. He suddenly got into my bed and he violently and against my will affected a criminal assault upon me. She was weak at the time and he completely covered my face and that I was unable to cry out and I was utterly unable to prevent him affecting his purpose or call for help. The next day, Dr Houston visited again and threatened that if I told anyone, he would say that I was insane. She spoke to Lady Officer, the only friend I had in New Norfolk to whom I could speak on such a subject, and was advised to not speak of the matter to anyone, but should Dr Houston attempt a similar act again, to tell him that I had complained to her. Mrs Kenny wrote that she followed instructions and said nothing more about the matter, intending as soon as she could to retire from the hospital and be saved from the necessity of meeting Dr Houston in the future. On her telling Mrs Houston, she reiterated, reiterated that Mrs Houston was very frightened and prayed me not to say anything to anyone, saying that he was the most violent man and that she dreaded the consequences if he knew I had told her. She alleges that Mrs Houston, sometime in May, informed her son-in-law, Mr Jamison, who is a commissioner for the hospital and warden for the municipality of New Norfolk, and I was ordered to attend Dr Houston's office on the 8th day of May, 1879. During that meeting, Mrs Houston's behaviour to me was most violent, and Mr Jamison had to hold her to prevent her attacking me. She said she was cross-examined cross severely by Dr Houston and claims that she was still very weak and nervous and being brought face to face with Dr Houston without anyone to assist me, I was so confused that I was quite unable to give a properly clear or satisfactory account of what had taken place. Of the evidence given to the nurses and other servants at the hospital, she claims they were utterly false, concocted and without foundation. She also states that while she was given the opportunity to question the witnesses without assistance or advice, I did not know how to do so. After this meeting of the committee in Hobart Town, Mrs Kenny had sought legal counsel with legal advice with her counsel, who wrote to the committee chair requesting that she be properly represented at any further meetings. The request was denied. Mrs Kenny was then advised by her counsel not to attend any further meetings. Regardless of this, the committee did summon Mrs Kenny and despite her initial refusal to attend without her counsel present, she felt obligated. At this meeting, a statement from Dr Houston was read and in it he denied all Mrs Kenny's accusations and she was asked if she would like to question him. Again, as she was unrepresented, she claimed she did not know how to do so and so declined. Mrs Kenny complains to His Excellency that she has been unfairly and harshly dealt with, that I have not had justice done to me. She concludes her statement with the following. 
No one can believe it possible that I could falsely charge Dr. Houston, for your excellency will see the trouble and anxiety and loss of good and lucrative position which has been entailed upon me by making his conduct known, and which I could not have foreseen would be the consequence of this publicity. That up to the time when the outrage was committed, I had always been on the best of terms with Dr. Houston and had always spoken well of him and of his kindness to me in my illness. I had nothing I could possibly gain by bringing a charge against him, but everything to lose. And although, if Dr. Houston remains at the hospital, I could not retain the position on acceptance of which has unfortunately brought me some trouble and ruined my health and has destroyed my peace of mind, and I humbly pray that the person who has so improperly behaved to me may not be allowed in order to save himself to destroy my good character and ruin and impoverish me for the rest of my life. Despite having previously argued against wanting to press criminal charges against Dr Houston, upon the conclusion of the committee's inquiry, it is made known that she will indeed proceed with a criminal case. On July 10, 1879, Charles Hamilton Bromby writes to the Colonial Secretary requesting that the case of the Queen versus Houston not be held in New Norfolk, owing to the possible miscarriage of justice that may occur. He is informed by Thomas Raby, Raby that the government has no power to interfere. Mrs Kenny's criminal complaint against Dr Houston ultimately began at the Hobart Supreme Court in Campbell Street on the 25th of July 1879 in front of Commissioner Whiteford, who had been selected by the government to hear the case. Mr C.H Bromby appeared for Mrs Kenny. Mr W.R. Giblin, instructed by Mr Curzon Orbort for Dr. Orb for Dr Houston, and the trial... The trial was held to test Mrs Kenny's evidence and basically it was just a rehashing of the committee's report. And it was held in private, um, except for the fact that there was press present, yeah, who dutifully printed the full account each day's testimony and also were given a copy of the committee's report. At the conclusion of the three days, His Honour stated that allowing it to be possible that the complaint's past statements may have been affected the complainant's past statements may have been affected more or less by sickness and mental agitation, as she, Mrs Kenny, has affirmed. I can only deal with them as I find them. In their variance from her evidence here, they are of past re repair, and standing in this light, they do deprive the charge laid before me of that credit essential so grave, to so grave an accusation. To put the accused upon trial such test on such testimony would be impossible and the complaint against him is dismissed. It has been suggested that the truth of the matter is that there was probably a consensual affair between the two and that Mrs Kenny, fearing she may have been pregnant, cried rape, leaving Dr Houston to deny ever having an intimate relationship. And I will qualify that quote. So the people, um, the information I've read, a lot of the people that have made that assumption are actually descendants of Dr Houston's. So take that as you will. Um, Further to that, it could be argued that the architect of Mrs Kenny's downfall was Mrs Houston, called a very jealous-minded woman by Mrs Kenny. It would appear that Mrs Houston did truly believe that Mrs Kenny was pregnant by her husband, a logical assumption given her distended abdomen and what Mrs Houston knew of her husband's character. Um, suggest and suggested that the gossip about her condition was spreading among the nurses. Um, was it the type of damage control that Mrs Houston employed? Should the end result be a bastard child? Uh, let's get her first before she can come after my husband and therefore my family. After all, it was Mrs Houston who had first brought the allegations to the notice of her son-in-law, Mr Jamison, which kick-started the inquiries. Mrs Kenny, remember, had wanted to keep the affair quiet and strove to protect Dr Houston and had never said she was pregnant. Mrs Kenny denied on the 8th of May before Mr Jamison and Mrs Houston that he, Dr Houston, had assaulted her, but for, one, but for one exception for which he had no doubt was sorry, and that he had shown her great kindness and been gentlemanly in his conduct. Mrs Kenny further denied having ever told Mrs Houston anything to the contrary and attributed the whole scandal to Mrs Houston's jealousy. We may never know what actually did or did not occur between the two, but regardless of whether it was criminal assault or consensual, Mrs Kenny paid dearly. After being dismissed from her position, she moved to Hobart Town, where she took up residence in Waterloo House, a boarding house, which is on the corner of Davie and Murray Streets. It's actually now Butler McIntyre and Butler Law Firm. Um, 
Um, and upon returning to Norfolk to collect her belongings from the matron's cottage and collect her final cheque, which she actually refused, she was met with an angry mob of men and women, including nurses from the asylum, who brought out an effigy of a woman on a pole and set fire to it and been screaming, howling, groaning and hisses. Mrs Kenny and her companion were terrified and barricaded themselves inside, met inside the matron's cottage, which was dark, cold, had little food or water. And her companion was able to leave the following morning. However, Mrs Kenny was subjected to further abuse and remained in fear for her life. She stayed there for another three days until Dr McFarlane, at the request of the colonial secretary, intervened and she was able to leave and return to Hobart. The incident was reported in the Mercury on the 1st of September 1879 as follows. Sorry. Mrs Kenny, the ex-matron of the Norfolk Asylum, who has made herself unpleasantly notorious in connection with an unfounded charge which she laid against the superintendent, Dr Houston, still figures conspicuously before the public. On her return to the asylum, under the pretense of taking away her effects, the indignation of her fellow servants led to an open expression of their abhorrence, which, with her lively imagination, Mrs Kenny readily described to the sympathising colonial secretary, as well as something like an attempt upon her personal safety. The gullible colonial secretary readily swallowed her improbable story, and the result was an investigation which, after mildly reprimanding those who joined in manifesting their loathing, the commissioner could not feel he could pursue the matter further. To add insult to injury, at the conclusion of this trial, Mrs Kennedy was charged with perjury. It was claimed that she committed willful and corrupt perjury before Commissioner Whiteford in July 26, 1860, 1860, 1879 at Hobart Town. After three days of testimony from Dr Houston and his team, again led by Curzon Allport and the Attorney General, during which Mrs Kenny character was once again maligned in open court and in the press, the jury were unable to agree on a verdict and she was discharged. Um, one particularly harsh. Oh. Oh. There we go. So this was actually an example of what the Attorney General S. Dodd said um, during the trial. Yeah. She was a pale, emaciated, an object of pity rather than otherwise. And where would there be an appeal in her physical condition to the passions of a man? What was there in the prisoner to make him assault her? Where was the sun-like beauty to make a man forget himself in the miserable, haggard, emaciated woman, a woman who was confined to bed with an illness of a particular character? And this was printed in the papers as well after he said it in court. Dr Crowther, who had been a great support to Mrs Kenny, tried to get subscriptions to pay Mrs Kenny's legal expenses, but this was unsuccessful. In contrast, it was reported in the Launceston Examiner on the 30th of December 1879 that on Wednesday evening last, a number of influential residences of New Norfolk presented Dr Houston, medical and superintendent for the insane, with a testimonial expressing sympathy for him in the trials he had recently passed through and also expressing pleasure that the charges had been proved unfounded. The testimonial was accompanied by the purse of sovereigns. On Wednesday, the 31st of December, 1879, those same residents published their address in support of Dr. Houston and they asked that he accept the purse to go towards the heavy expenses which you have been compelled to incur in defending your character from so vile an attack. Dr. Houston duly published his reply in which he thanks them for their generosity and writes, if anything could contribute to alleviate the mortification I've been subject to from the last most from the late most unjust persecution, it would be this mark of sympathy and confidence from so many of my brother townsmen and neighbours, which of itself could prove a sufficient answer to the imputations that have been cast upon my character. On the 2nd of October 1880, an article announcing the retirement of Dr Houston appears in the Mercury, and he was succeeded at the asylum by Dr William H McFarlane. According to Gal, and so um, Gal wrote the book, um, the Troubled Asylum, which is uh, pretty much the, the history of 
of the Norfolk Asylum. It's got the longest name in history, that book. Um, Dr. Houston's influence was never to be far from the hospital. He was a regular visitor in, his pri in the private, uh, he was a regular visitor in his private GP capacity. And in 1882, he was appointed a commissioner of the hospital. From all accounts, he was a man who liked his own way and did not take kindly to suggestions from underlings. In fact, his continual interference with the administration of the hospital led to a report by Dr. William Crowther, there he is, over another dismissal, this time of the matron who had succeeded the unfortunate plaintiff in 1879. Yes, another matron. Miss Martha Leyland had been appointed as matron of the asylum in November 1879 following Mrs. Kenny's dismissal. Miss Leyland had come to Tasmania from Victoria, where she had held the position of matron at the Melbourne Benevolent Society and Bendigo General Hospital and was in no doubt shocked at the primitive conditions she found upon her revival. She would later report in an 1883 Royal Commission into the present conditions of asylums for the insane in Tasmania that the sick ward was presided over by an untrained and consequently unskilled nurse. Conditions were dark, gloomy and ill-ventilated. There were no night nurses and day nurses were compelled to sleep in the wards with their patients that she had repeatedly informed the superintendent that there was a need to separate some patients, especially those with epilepsy, hire night nurses and improve sanitation and conditions. She was able to successfully achieve the last two. Miss Leyland also claimed that it became clear to her that it was she who was expected to make discovery of mental improvement or recovery in the female patients, which she knew to be more than her duties, but which she was pleased to do so. However, in August 1883, Miss Leyland was accused of being in liquor while on duty. It was reported in the Tasmanian News on the 2nd of January 1884 in testimony made to Dr Houston as a commissioner by Dr McFarlane and nurses at the hospital that in July of 1883, Miss Leyland was talking incoherently and appeared to be under the influence of drink. Mr McFarlane, at the time superintendent of the hospital, however, did not consider her to be drunk and incapable and so did not suspend her from duty. It would, however, be brought to the attention of the commissioners and when the charge on the piece of paper was passed around the members, it was in Dr Houston's handwriting. This is implying that Dr Houston used his influence to bring charges against the new matron and although she defended herself against these charges, she was dismissed. In September 1883, following the dismissal of Miss Leyland and the earlier Royal Commission, Dr W. R. L. Crowther, unsatisfied with both, launched his own investigation into the internal and general management of the Hospital for the Insane in New Norfolk. The report was tabled to the Legislative Council on the 14th of December 1883 and concluded in part that... The management of the insane at New Norfolk is and has been devoid of system, tact or administrative ability and that in every department of the institution, with some exceptions, humanity, kindness and consideration for the helpless insane have not found a place and that knowledge, even of the most elementary character applicable to the treatment of the demented, has not been possessed by the majority of those who care and supervise those entrusted to their keeping. Miss Leyland, it found, did possess tact, knowledge and discrimination necessary to the successful treatment of the insane and whose valuable services have, for present, been lost to the institution through instrumentally and unwarranted interference of Mr G.F. Houston, whose very questionable position as a commissioner and the influence he exercises over the superintendent and subordinates of the establishment your committee feels to bring under the notice of the legislature. 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 The dismissal of Miss Leyland they found to be unjust and was the outcome of a deliberate conspiracy in which Mr. G. F. Houston and Dr. Farlan, McFarlane have taken part. Under questioning by Mr. Crowther's select committee, Alexander Riddick, who was um, Riddick, was a hospital commissioner and the police magistrate for the district, and he writes in relation to Dr. Houston that. I think it very undesirable that he should be a member of the board as he is head of the local police and the coroner's office. I think it's scarcely compatible with any other duties and taking into consideration the relative position of Dr Houston and Dr McFarlane formally and at the same time, it is necessarily embarrassing to the, la to the latter to have Dr Houston in such a position. I am of the opinion of my own personal knowledge of Dr Houston's treatment of the late Mrs McLaughlin. I've not been able to find what that's about, but I'm working on it. Um, the great scandal in connection with Mrs Kenny 
and the evident um, animus towards Miss Leyland that it would be difficult to retain anyone who has any self-respect while he continued to occupy that seat as he, as he does on the commission or exercise as much influence. Mr Riddick also commented that he, given the treatment of the preceding and current matrons, he would not recommend any female seek a role at the asylum while Dr Houston was still in a position of influence and that his reasoning as to why Miss Leyland was charged and dismissed by Drs McFarlane and Houston was that she exhibited the greatest interest and intelligence in the performance of her duty and I cannot help but think that the charge was pressed and that mainly because of her experience and knowledge were greater than theirs and because she dared to have an opinion of her own. She also had the, um, the gall to ask for a raise, which prompted Dr Houston to insist upon a confidential report to be conducted into her conduct. 1883 was not a great year for Dr Houston. Um, <laughs> He was dragged into another scandal, but this time it was not one of his own making. For 1883 was the year of the notorious divorce trial of his daughter Annie and son-in-law Curzon Allport. The suit brought by Curzon against his wife was for, amongst other things, adultery, which Curzon alleged was committed during 1878 and 79. That must have been a very tough time for that family. Um, I previously covered this in my talk. This is a shameless plug, by the way. Uh, my talk, The Life of Curzon Allport, Greed, Booze, Assault and Debauchery, which is on the YouTube, which, uh, no, sorry, which is on the SoundCloud. In 1885, George Francis Houston and his wife celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary with a grand ball at New Norfolk, and he was elected to the House of Assembly as a representative for New Norfolk in July 1886. Life pretty much went on as normal for the Houstons. They celebrated marriages, births, mourned deaths, and lived a comfortable society life. As for Gertrude Kenny, she petitioned the, for compensation for the injury she received while matron at the asylum, a petition supported by Dr. Crowther and his son Edward, as well as the bishop. The petition claimed that she was unable to work and had no other means of support. Mrs. Kenny was subjected to examination by two government-appointed, unbiased doctors, who concluded that the tumour she developed was already large enough to be a severe hindrance to her obtaining livelihood of any active occupation and that she would likely be compel her altogether in the course of time to lead a life of an invalid. She was granted £250 in compensation. According to Miranda Morris, who wrote her thesis called A Place in the Empire Negotiating the Life of Gertrude Kenny, Utah's, that her husband, George Kenny, died in March of 1886 and was given a pauper's burial at Coloni Colonial Cornelian Bay. Mrs Kenny herself died in South Australia on the 18th of April 1885 from complications of her uterine tumour. At the time of her death, she was living at the destitute asylum in Adelaide. George Francis Houston died in December 1890 of acute tonsillitis at his home in La Maison in New Norfolk, and he was 78 years old. His obituary appeared in all the major papers of the day and he was filled with his professional achievements and growing reports of his life. It was reported the funeral was the largest to have ever been seen at New Norfolk. That's St Matthew's Church. So that's in um, New Norfolk and that's where pretty much all the Houstons married, died, got buried. That's his headstone. If you can see that, it's a terrible photo, but that's his headstone at the... Um, Cemetery in New Norfolk, the old cemetery, what's left of it. Um, so the chief mourners included his son-in-law's Justice Adams, Mrs J.M. Clark and Curzon Allport, and his only surviving son, Mr G.F. Houston. He was survived by his wife, Sarah, his daughters, Annie Allport, Kate Adams, not for very long, Ethel Houston, Florence Houston, Sarah Jameson, and son, George Francis Houston, and many of his grandchildren. So who was George Francis Houston really? A father, loving grandfather, gentleman, friend, caregiver or misogynistic predator who, while protected by the patriarchal society in which he lived, got away with committing crimes against a vulnerable woman in his employ. Perhaps he was all of these, each part overlapping the other to create the whole. We may never know for sure. And what of the generation of Houstons who followed him? How, had, how did they weather their father's scandal? Each would have their own story to tell, some triumphant, some tragic, but each worth telling in their own right. That's it. That's his wife's gravestone too. Thank you.
question? Questions? Anyone got a question? Any questions? Oh, so Walter Jamison, in case anyone's wondering what happened to him, he actually died a few years after the inquiry. He drowned in the, the Derwent. And there was an inquest into his um, into his death. Yeah, actually it was a boating trip. And he died. Yeah, that's it. That's all I've got. Oh, no, 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 no. Clap again, sir. Thanks.